In the previous video, we looked at how we can estimate frequencies of genotypes, but if we think about what evolution really is, is what we're really interested in is we want to consider change in genotype frequencies. Right? Evolution is all about change. So let's think about a population of a bunch of individuals with each of our three genotypes. And we're going to have this population reproduce. So individuals are going to randomly kind of pair up with other individuals and produce offspring. And then we're going to calculate what are the frequencies of the alleles after one generation of this. And so to simplify things, we're going to just let the frequency of each of these genotypes, which we know is p squared, we're going to represent that with an x. Frequency of this genotype, which we know to be 2pq, we'll just represent that with a y. Frequency of this, we'll represent that with a q squared, which is z. So we'll come back to this. So when these two genotypes mate with each other, all their offspring are as such. When this genotype mates with this genotype, half of their offspring are like this, half of their offspring have that genotype. When these guys reproduce, all of their offspring are this heterozygous genotype. Similarly, this mating here produces 50% of each of these genotypes. This heterozygous cross here produces this, which we've seen before. And then that mating there, half are like this, half have this genotype and then quickly filling out the rest of the table. So these are the genotypes produced by each of these different combinations of mating. And then how frequent are those matings? Well, they depend on each of those frequencies. So the frequency here of this genotype was x, frequency of this genotype was y, frequency of this genotype was z, because that's what we did here. This is just to kind of simplify some of the math we're about to do. So when we have this, and we want to think about how the genotype frequencies change, we want to ask some sort of question like, what is the new frequency of this genotype after one generation of this random mating? So the random mating means that they'd just be pairing off according to their frequencies. So let's think about the new frequency of this capital A homozygote, for example. So where do new individuals with this genotype come from? They come from this mating here. And how frequent is that mating? That mating happens with that frequency. This genotype comes from here. And a half of all the offspring of that mating produce this genotype. And then how common is that mating? It's x times y. Where else does that genotype come from? Not there. From here. So a half of all those matings. And then that genotype is also produced in a quarter of all the matings between those genotypes. So that's one quarter of the time. And how frequent is that mating? y squared. So we can simplify this a little bit, x squared. These two terms can combine into a single xy. And then we still have a one quarter y squared. So we have this equation for the new frequency of this. But we actually know what x and y are because they're from up here. So we know that x is p squared and we know that y is 2pq. So we can substitute those in. So this is really p squared squared plus p squared times 2pq plus one quarter of 2pq squared. So let's continue to simplify this down here. This is now p to the fourth plus 2p to the third q plus, when we square this, we'll get a four, and that'll cancel with this quarter. So that will cancel and we'll get just p squared q squared. And then all of these terms have a p squared. So we can pull a p squared out. And that gives us p squared plus 2pq 
plus just q squared. And then we have this result from before that all of this is just equal to 1. So we get our final result of p squared. So what is the new frequency of this genotype after one generation of random mating? It's p squared, which was the original frequency of this genotype before all the random mating. So what that tells us is that with random mating, if we're going to be interested in what are the changes in the genotype frequencies, at least this genotype frequency is not going to change after one generation of this random mating. And then similar proofs, such as one of the ones you'll be doing in your homework, um, show that, well, these things don't change. And that, in fact, they stay constant at the frequencies that we had from before, that basically these stay at those values. So if you have alleles in a population with this panmictic random mating, the allele frequencies aren't going to change, the genotype frequencies aren't going to change, and the genotype frequencies will be given by these values. So we just saw that genotype frequencies don't change, and therefore allele frequencies don't change. So one of the things that we want to think about is under what conditions is that true. So these results that we just derived, these results hold if a certain set of assumptions are true. So they hold if the following assumptions are true. First, we had no differences between the alleles in terms of how often they reproduced, right? Both the capital A and the lowercase a allele reproduced at frequencies equal to their own frequencies in the population. There was nothing about one allele or the other that caused it to reproduce more. And so what that means is there was no selection, right? There were no differences in the fitness of these alleles. Also, the alleles that we were looking at that were mating and being combined to produce the next generation, the next generation was inheriting alleles from the parents unchanged. So that means there was also no mutation. There were no changes in the actual alleles themselves. When we looked at our population and we were doing our calculations, we just had one panmictic population that we were thinking about. The alleles in the next generation were a result of matings within that population. There were no other populations introducing individuals, and none of the individuals being produced were leaving the population. So there was, in fact, also no migration, no movement. The fourth one is when we were using our equations to predict the frequencies of offspring, we were kind of accepting that the frequencies they were being produced are exactly as predicted from the frequencies of the alleles in the parent generation. There was no kind of, there was no randomness that was causing the frequencies to differ from that expected from our equations. No randomness is equivalent to considering the population to be infinite in size. So mathematically, no randomness is the same thing as having an infinite population size. And then our fifth assumption that was in there, and this is a, looks a lot like the first assumption, but it's different, is we also assumed that there was random mating. So in addition to the fact that the alleles were all the same in terms of their overall reproduction, we also combined them together at random. We did not say that the capital A alleles combined with capital A alleles more often, say, than they did with lowercase a alleles. Everything was completely random. And so random mating is kind of equivalent to saying there's no geography. Right? Individuals typically mate with individuals who are nearby to themselves instead of individuals that are further away. We assumed a panmictic population where everybody could mate with everybody. There was no inbreeding, either deliberate inbreeding or the avoidance of inbreeding. There were no rare male effects or any of the other sorts of things that could lead to non-random mating. So these five things, 
were kind of implicit assumptions in our mathematical proof. And so basically, if 1 through 5 are true, then there's no evolution, right? The allele frequencies don't change, the genotype frequencies don't change, and our definition of evolution as change in allele frequencies means there's no evolution at all. And when that happens, we say that the population is at something called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So you may have um, remember Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium from 211 or for gen from genetics or something like that. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is when these assumptions are met, there's no evolution. And this essentially acts as the null model for population genetics and evolution, right? This is the situation under which there's no evolution. So we can contrast this with things that would cause there to be evolution, and that would be when one of these things is not true. So if you do have evolution, if there is evolution, then one or more of the assumptions is not true. And so this list of assumptions acts as a guide. So if things are evolving, then one or more of the assumptions are not true. So this means that the five assumptions that we have above can act as a guide to the factors that will cause evolution, right? If all five of these things are true, evolution doesn't happen. Therefore, if we can just understand these five things, we'll understand the five ways in which evolution can happen, right? Evolution can happen if there is selection. Evolution can happen if there is mutation. Evolution can happen if there is migration. Evolution can happen when there is randomness. And evolution can happen via random mating. And there aren't any other ways that evolution would be happening because if all five of those things are as the assumptions assume, then evolution wouldn't occur. So you may have learned about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and maybe not understood why you memorized these five assumptions. The reason this is such a big deal is because this is going to act as a roadmap for our investigation of the forces that allow evolution to occur. So for the next few videos, we'll be looking at what happens to allele frequencies when each of these assumptions is violated in turn.